In this video, I'm going to introduce user-defined functions. We're moving on to the folder part 05, user-defined functions right there. All these files and all the videos you can find through links in the video descriptions. So open up that folder. There's a lot of files in this folder. Our user-defined functions are each going to be in their own separate MATLAB file. Now I'm going to open up part 035 underscore user underscore defined underscore functions dot m and we'll open up the rest of these files as we go along. Whenever you see these note to self things, you can ignore those. These are notes to myself here about how I'm going to divide up this particular document, part 035 or other documents into videos. So this one, this document is going to be divided into at least four videos, if not five. And the first one's just going to cover the user defined functions. And then we're going to deal with some other, other more niche detail issues uh, listed here. All of the content that I'm going to cover in this video, all this code works exactly the same in Octave as it does here in MATLAB. Now for the later videos using this same file, part 35, that's not necessarily true, but for this video, all this stuff works exactly as written in Octave as well. But first off, what are functions? You should think of functions as miniature programs that can be executed by using their name. We've already seen lots of MATLAB functions such as square root, abs, size, max, and many more. But now what we're gonna be doing is we're gonna be writing our own. Now, why would you bother to write your own functions? You could just write the same code in one of these files in the editor. Well, using functions facilitates dividing a big problem up into smaller problems. Smaller problems are easier to solve. Functions can also be placed in a library so that they can be used over and over and over. Often a small solution to a bigger problem is also useful as a small solution to other bigger problems. And if we have the function written already, then we've got access to that code, we can just run it. In this first section here, labeled poly third, I'm going to call a function named poly third. Now this function just calculates an arbitrary third degree polynomial based on its input and then returns a result, but we're gonna use it as a simple example. The file poly third.m is right there in the same current folder as part 035, as well as in the current folder that MATLAB is looking at, that is the focus of MATLAB right here. And we'll open it up momentarily. But first off terminology, I'm gonna use the phrase call the function. All that means is use the function's name and then parentheses, and then however many inputs the function takes, this simple function is only gonna take one input. We put those inputs inside the parentheses and then the function's code will calculate, will operate on that input value. So let me run this section, control enter. All right, here's our output. The value of a, that's my variable, with a value of four, was passed to the poly third function and the output or result was 265.0 repeating. When two was passed as the input, 41 was the result. When three was passed as the input, 121 was the result. And I have printed these out using fprintf, which I have mentioned before, but I haven't gone into detail about. And I still don't really wanna go into detail about Here's the basics of fprintf. It is itself a built-in MATLAB function. In its parentheses, we're gonna have in single quotes the text that we would like to display out, but there's special symbols that we can use in the fprintf. %d is going to be a placeholder for an integer value. Backslash n means that there should be a new line, like hitting the enter key, at the end of the printout of this text. And then still inside the parentheses after the comma, in this case, is a variable. This variable, the integer value of it, is going to be substituted in where the percent %d was located. And so that's why we see a 4 here and not a percent %d. Similarly, but slightly different, is percent %f. This is a different sort of placeholder. This is a placeholder for a number that's probably not an integer. It's going to have decimal places. And as you can see when it gets displayed out, it gets displayed out with decimal places even though they're all 0. So percent %d placeholder for an integer, percent %f, placeholder for what we call a floating point number, a number with a decimal place. And other than that, and the backslash n for a new line, that's really all you need to know for now about fprintf. Here are my three calls to the function, and I put the result in three different variables. That's not terribly important. Could have reused the same variable, but I didn't. I'm demonstrating that the input could be from a variable, the a equals 4 here, or it could just be a literal number. Now let's open up polythird.m and look at the function itself. There are some comments in here. You can put comments in the function file. And I should emphasize that the function file is simply a very normal MATLAB file. It has the .m extension and it has a name. 
The name of the file is a little bit important though. The name of the file has to match the name of the function. We see right here that it does. Every function that you write is going to start with the word function, and there it is in blue right here, followed by a variable to hold any of the returned values if there are any, or empty brackets if there aren't. So here there's going to be one returned result. I'm going to name the variable that's going to hold that result y and put it in square brackets. Then there's going to be an equal sign. Then there's going to be the name of the function, which has to match the file name. And then in parentheses, one or more variables to hold the inputs. I've named this variable x, but my input variable, at least once, was named a. It doesn't matter. There's like a handoff between the variables where the data gets passed from one to the other. They don't need to have the same name, and in fact, their names won't affect each other in any way. It's valuable to get in the habit of putting a comment right after the function header. So this first line here is called the function header. It's valuable to put a comment after that describing what the function does, and we'll see why a little bit later. Now after that, this is a very short function, I just have the calculation that's performed. It's an arbitrary third degree polynomial. I put the results of the calculation into the variable named y. y is my return variable. So that will be sent back as a result in my other script where I'm calling this function. And then I put end at the end to indicate that the function is finished. I also indent all of my code with just one tab of indents between the function header and the end at the bottom. That is for organizational purposes. Let's go back to our other file and continue on down for more examples. Ah, I almost skipped this here. Uh, I wrote my function such that it can take vectors as input and it also works correctly for vectors. So that's kind of a useful thing as well. We'll see more examples of that in the future. Moving on down. The following is a practice exercise from the textbook MATLAB for Engineers, 5th edition, and it suggests that we practice by writing a function to calculate and return e raised to the 1 over x power, where x is our input. So I have named my function x, x inverse, and it takes one input. And I just did 1, 2, and 3 here, got different results, and displayed them out. Control Enter. There are our three values right there for e raised to the 1 over x power, whether x is 1, 2, or 3. And now let's look at the function by opening up expx inverse.m. A lot of these initial examples are just going to be super short functions. We'll see some longer functions later on. Normally, it's valuable to write a little bit more code in these functions. Otherwise, just, you know, put it into the normal document. But we're trying to start simple here. Starts with the word function, square brackets. In the square brackets, as many return values as you want. Now, for the simple examples we're starting with, it's always just going to be one variable. But later, we'll see that it can be more. And then an equal sign, name of the function, which has to match the file name. And then in parentheses, whatever variable is going to hold your inputs. Indented, comments about the function itself. And then still indented, the code that actually performs the action of the function. In this case, raising e to the 1 over x power. And I'm using the dot slash for division in case my input is a vector, so that this still works on vector input. And then end at the bottom. Continuing on down. Another practice exercise from the book, we're going to write a function that converts between calories to joules. Now before I go through this code, let's look at cal to joule.m. All right, I've done a better job with my variable naming because there's actual context to this problem, so I can actually use sensible variable names. So first we start with the word function in this other file, and then in square brackets, my returned value is going to be in units of joules, so I'll name the variable joules, and then equals function name, parentheses, my input is in units of calories, so I'll use that word as my input variable name, comments that are indented, the code, the action performed by the function, indented, and then the word end to wrap it up. So back to my other MATLAB document right here, I'm going to use some of the same variable names. I'm going to set joules equal to 99, I'm going to run cal to joule with an input of 1, I'm actually not going to do anything with the result, so it'll just be displayed out in the command window automatically by MATLAB. And you see I have a comment here saying that it'll display out this number. And then I'm going to set a different variable, j, equal to cal to joule 500, so I'm going to capture the results, that returned value. Now in the function, the variable name with the returned value is joules. There's just like a handoff between the variables, with the value of joules being handed off to this variable named j over here. I'm going to print out j, and then I'm going to print out joules. Now you should ask yourself what this second f printf is going to print out. I haven't run it yet. Is it going to print out 99, or is it going to print out something else? Perhaps the same thing as j right here. Because 
don't I have this variable in the function named Jules? Isn't it getting set equal to a value? Think about that. I'm going to run it right now so you don't have long to think. Control Enter. So the 4184, that's printed out by this line of code because the returned value, the result given back by the function was 4.184. When J is printed out, it's 2092. And when joules is printed out, it's just 99 because this joules variable right here is different from this joules variable in the function file. And in fact, the two have no relation to each other. This is a good thing. This is known as scope. This joules variable is in scope in our file here with the part 35 user defined functions going to the function file. This variable named joules is a different variable that is in scope when we're running the function code. But the two scopes don't intermingle. You can think of the word scope as context. The two contexts don't intermingle. And that is a good thing. It would be very difficult to try and write our code and anticipate what variable names the programmers of MATLAB had used in built-in functions and avoid using all those variable names. It's confusing enough as is to avoid using variable names that already match up with function names. So thankfully, we only have to do that. We don't also have to worry about what hidden variable names they might have used because those hidden variable names won't interfere with the variables that we name ourselves. So the two Joule variables are unrelated. They are in different files and they do not affect each other. Continuing on down. Functions in MATLAB are capable of returning multiple results. This is somewhat of a unique feature to MATLAB, or at least I haven't seen it in other programming languages. So here I've got this motion function. Let me open that up in motion.m. And as we see, the function header looks a little bit different. It starts with the word function, as it must. And then in the square brackets, we've got three different variables, dist, vel, and excel, which are just abbreviations of distance, velocity, and acceleration. Equal sign, the name of the function, parentheses, the one input, t for time. And then we calculate the acceleration, velocity, and distance, put the results into those variables, and we can get access to one or more of those results by changing what's on the left side of the equal sign when we call the function. So for example, if I want all three results, well, I need to put in square brackets, three different variables separated by commas before the equal sign, before calling the function and passing in the input. Let's run this section and see how it works. So if I do have those three variables, I get all three results. But I don't have to. I can just request, give me just two of the results. If I just have two variables, I get the first two. And if I just have one variable in the square brackets, or no square brackets at all and just one variable, then I just get the first result. So this provides some interesting flexibility for MATLAB. And we've seen this put to use with the max function, the size function, and others. Note that when you're writing your function and developing it, you may want to have the function print out some intermediate results, display those in the command window. But once you're wrapping things up and completing your function, you really want to make sure to suppress any intermediate calculations using semicolons. So in here, what I mean is, I want to make sure there's semicolons on these lines of code so that I'm not seeing these intermediate values pop out on the command window alongside the rest of the stuff in my script. That can be confusing for whoever's using your function, which may or may not be you, depending on how big your development group is and who's working with your MATLAB code. I mentioned earlier that you want to get in the habit of putting comments right beneath the function header, that first line in your function file. So I have these comments right here. And what's cool about this is if then you use the help command on a function that you created or functions that are you know built into MATLAB, so help motion here, well, it displays out the comments right below that function header. So that's kind of just a handy little feature implemented in MATLAB. Square brackets are mandatory when gathering multiple results from a function. So you saw above when I was getting, for example, two results from the motion function, um, if you're just getting one result, then you don't actually have to have square brackets. But if you're getting more than one, you have to have the square brackets. This doesn't really work. So let's run it. All right. In fact, it throws an error. Continue on down. The type command can be used to take a peek inside of all your user-defined functions, as well as some MATLAB functions. And we've seen this already to take a look into files that we've tried to read in, any sort of text file will display in the command window if you put its name after the word type. 
But here, I'm going to take a look into the MATLAB sphere function, which I did not write, right? This came with MATLAB. And here we see the actual code of the sphere function. So function, it potentially returns three results, uh, equals the name of the function, sphere. Var r again here. I'm not actually going to talk about this until probably a later video, but this function can take in different numbers of inputs. That's, that's what that's about. And then we see the comments right after the function header right there. So this will be what's displayed out if we use that help command. And then we literally get into the code, including comments. And I think that's pretty cool. You can just take a peek sort of under the surface and look into certain functions, such as sphere. Now it doesn't work on all functions, so it doesn't work on like cosine here. So it says cosine is a built-in function uh, and doesn't give you any more detail. And you might say like, well, when, didn't you just say that sphere is also a built-in function? Yeah, I'm not 100% sure on what the difference is. My guess is that the sphere function is written in MATLAB, whereas COS might be implemented in, for example, C code. So MATLAB itself is built on the C programming language. And for efficiency, you might want some of your more commonly used functions to be like compiled C code. I'm making that up. I'm not 100% sure that that's exactly uh, the reason why, but we can't see any MATLAB code for COS, and I suspect there's just like an optimization reason for that. And it works on our created functions as well. So type motion, and we see our motion code right there. All right, another problem from MATLAB for engineers, just asking you to write a function for an arbitrary arithmetic expression. And I mostly want you to note it works on vectors. It works with multiple inputs. So I'll run the code here. There's not much to see out, just some, just some numeric results, but let's open up uh, P over sine. All right, a relatively short function like the others, but by using operations such as the dot slash for element-wise division, our code is built to work with vectors as well as um, scalar inputs, inputs that are just a number. If there are multiple inputs to the function, we just name those variables whatever we wish and separate them with commas. Now, most functions are actually a little bit longer than the ones that I've demonstrated, right? A lot of these have just been for example purpose. So let's look at one uh, named hailstone right here, and I'll open this up. So here's hailstone.m, and I wrote this. And the idea is that it calculates the length of a hailstone sequence. But I tried to make it a little bit more generic where you could specify what you use as the divisor and the multiplier. If you've never heard of the hailstone sequence, it's not terribly important. There's a mathematical conjecture called the Colatz conjecture about whether or not any positive whole number that you feed into this process eventually ends up back at one. And the process is if the number is divisible by two, you divide it by two. Otherwise, you take your number and you multiply it by three and add one. And then whatever your new number is, you repeat the process on that new number. Now, like I said, I tried to make mine a little bit more generic where you can choose what the divisor is and what the multiplier is other than using two and three. Um, it turns out that other multipliers and divisors are not actually very interesting and, and only two and three are the ones where you really get any interesting results. But, you know, I needed to find that out for myself. So here's the code I wrote. And we're gonna see some things that I haven't yet covered in my videos. But I wanted to show you what does a bigger function look like. That function header looks pretty much the same. Function, name of the return variable in brackets equals name of the function. In this case, three inputs. A comment describing what the function does. We can create variables inside the function. I believe we've already seen that. We can write loops and if statements and else statements, and these will all be covered in later videos. Here I'm using the modulus function to determine if one number x is divisible by another number, divisor. And then I do some calculations and repeat my while loop and sequence length, whatever value has accumulated in this variable, that's what ultimately is returned by the function. So consider that maybe a little bit of a preview. And I mean, it's not very interesting to run this section. It just gives you 16 as the length of the hailstone sequence uh, for the number seven using the default inputs of two and three for the divisor and the multiplier. Here's another arbitrary calculation that the book suggested we do as practice. I have three vector inputs. Now note that I put them in in the order C, A, B. My function is named wex. Let me open that one up. All right, so here's my arbitrary calculation for wex here. Takes in three inputs, does these calculations right here. What I wanna emphasize with this example is that the order of your inputs absolutely matters. This first input C right here, the value in that variable, the two, four, one, 
gets put into the variable named w inside the function. The first input goes with the first value in here. The second input, the a, goes with the second value in the function, in this case x, and the third one goes with y. So the order matters of those inputs, which I hope is how people would expect it, but I feel is worth mentioning. Now finally, let me show you just the process of writing a function for ourselves. So follow along as we write a function that takes one input, returns one output. Inside the function, what we're gonna do is we're gonna check if the upper left value of the input, so row one, column one, is greater than the lower right value, end end, then the function returns the transpose of the input, otherwise the function returns the original input. Now, why do we care about that? I'm not sure, but that's just what the exercise is gonna be. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna click on the plus sign right up here and open up a new file. I'm gonna start with the word function. There is going to be a return value. I'm just gonna name it y because there's not really a lot of specific context to this problem. And I'm gonna use an equal sign and then the function name. Now it's kind of an abstract problem, so we're gonna do our best to give it a sensible name, but I think I'm just gonna name it like maybe matrix transpose um, because it maybe does a transpose and maybe doesn't. Um, that's the best name I got. Maybe you can come up with a better one. Our input, I'm gonna name it lowercase m. It is a matrix input. And then after that, I'm actually gonna paste in those comments right there because I think that's gonna be helpful to refer to. Uh, and as well as if somebody uses help and then our function name, that text will display out and hopefully that will help them understand what's going on. I'm gonna go ahead and put end at the very bottom just so I don't forget. And I'm gonna indent on line eight and begin writing my code. Now, I haven't actually done a video yet on if, but I am gonna use if in this. Uh, basically, if and then something that's true or false, and if the thing is true, you do some code, otherwise you do some other code. And what we're checking with the if is if the upper left value of the input is greater than the lower right. So if the matrix in row one, column one, is greater than the matrix in the last row and the last column, then what we wanna do is return the transpose of the input. So, uh, excuse me, y equals transpose of m. Otherwise, return the original input. Now, there's a few different ways to do that. I'm gonna do it this way. It's probably not the most efficient way, but this is how I'm gonna do it. All right, there we go, that's our code. And I understand if you're not familiar with if and else or comfortable with that yet, don't, don't worry about it. Now I go to save this file, control S. The suggested file name is already the same name as my function. And that's excellent. That's what it has to be. Otherwise, this won't work. So I click Save. I'm going to double click on the name there and then copy it. Just so when I go back over here and I want to actually run this code, I've already got uh, the name of the function right there. All right, so let me get a matrix. I'm going to create a quick little matrix right here. I don't have to name it M, so I won't. I'll name it matrix. And then I'll set it equal to, uh, let's see, 1 colon 4. And then on the next line, it'll be four colon eight. I believe that's the, those are the same dimensions. And then our new matrix, we'll just replace the old one, and it'll be the maybe matrix transpose of this variable named matrix. All right, let's go ahead and run that and see what we get. And I did a vert cat error because this is one, two, three, four different numbers, but this is four, five, six, seven, eight, five different numbers. So that's just a mistake on my part. Change that to a seven and try again. And there we go. Now, because this first value was not bigger than this last value, we did not transpose it. However, if instead I swap the four through seven and the one through four, sorry, I don't know what popped up on the screen there. That was very odd. But if I swap them, oh, it actually still doesn't work because they're still not greater. Whoopsie daisy. I should probably show, show more code throughout to show you know how to get through some of these errors and how to fix things and just adapt. But there we go. I'm just going to change this to be a countdown, four down to one instead of one up to four. And now I misspelled transpose. All right, so lots of mistakes. That's okay. So let me go back in here. I always seem to miss the S on transpose, but there we go. Now it's spelled transpose. And we will try one more time here. There we go. So there's our original. And because this value in the upper left is greater than the value in the lower right, we do end up transposing it. It's important to understand the concept of scope. So I'm gonna mention it one more time here. What happens in the function stays in the function other than the values that are returned. But those values are going to be placed in 
whatever variable or variables we're setting equal to the function. So this is just a little example to maybe put that idea in your head, give you something to remember it by. So maybe you've heard the phrase, what happens in Vegas stays in Vegas. So our function is named Vegas, really just to illustrate that point. I'll open it up here. It's kind of a weird looking function, but that's on purpose. It sets a variable named g equal to negative 10, sets a and b to one plus their previous values, displays some stuff out, which often we would not do inside of a function, and then returns a result value that's the sum of a, b, and g. Now in the section that calls this function, we also have variables g, a, b, and also x and y. Note that the input variables, the values that are passed into the function are stored in variables x and y, which are not named the same as the variables inside the parentheses of the function. They don't have to be. There's a handoff that takes place between the variables on the outside passing their values to these variables used on the inside of the function. And also what you will see, I'm going to spoil it right now, is that the values of g, a, and b outside of the function up here are not altered by calling the function, even though the code inside modifies variables of the same name. So let's run this section here, control enter, and we have some printouts from inside the function. We print out the values of a and b. You can go back and revisit that code or, or just check back earlier in the video, but the values are four and eight because that's x plus one and y plus one. But on the outside down here, when I print out the values of g, z, a, and b, well, g and a and b, keep the same values as before. I'm not 100% sure why the formatting of G looks so interesting there. Oh, it's because I used uh, percent %D to display it out when really I should have used percent %F. So that's a little bit on me. There we go, that looks a little bit more normal. And Z is simply the result returned by the Vegas function. So what happens in Vegas stays in Vegas, what happens in the function stays in the function. 